let's talk about writing. Let's start at the very beginning. When did you know you wanted to be a writer? Oh, blimey. That's, um, I, I used to draw. That's what I used to do. When I was a kid, I used to draw all the time, like, like everywhere, on surfaces, on desks and everything. And I used to draw, like, I used to have asterisks and stuff like that, and, and, and peanuts. And, and So that's what I used to do. I didn't, I didn't, know, I was, I didn't know I was writing, because I was drawing. These endless cartoon strips, endless Doctor Who cartoon strips as well, things like that. And so it was only around about... In my life, I suppose, it was kind of like when I was about... I was into my 20s where I kind of thought, oh, you're not drawing, you're writing. That's the part of it you like. And, and then the writing bit of it took over. So, so I wasn't sitting there. It's not one of those stories. Like, I'm going to be a writer. I'm determined to do this. It didn't dawn on me until my 20s, really. But you constantly told yourself stories yeah. and... and Yes. ...were always in a different world, an imaginative world. Yes, I suppose. I just thought... I just thought that's what everyone does. Well, I think everyone does do that. Um, but I saw you tell a story about walking home from school, how that was your best time for like, writing ideas. Yes, and... I mean, I've always been. Yes, I used to walk home from school all on my own and i get really pissed off if someone joined me. <laughs> they rarely did. I was a lonely child. <laughs> but, um, uh, and it's the same, that was always the same. It's my other life, is that I ended up writing Queer as Folk because I used to go out clumping on Canal Street on my own. And I used to be really pissed off if I bump into Paul Marcus or something. With people go, oh, hello. I'm like, oh, hi. And I'd much rather be there on my own. And I ended up writing Queer as Folk out of that through 10 years of going out clubbing and just standing at a railing and watching it all. I love that. I still love that. It's, uh, I'm getting too old to do that now. But, um, and finding characters, watching characters, or not being that literal. I mean, seeing people and thinking, oh, oh seeing that's... people. Like, I mean, that's, yeah, that's why I've leapt straight onto Queer as Folk now. But it's like, that's why the material, I was so lucky that I got to write that first because someone would have written that show anyway. Because especially, I mean, all clubs, when people are dancing, are escaping something. They're escaping their week and escaping their life. But a gay club, especially then, even more so. You're looking at people and you'd know they'd be dancing away and snogging and taking drugs and you sort of thing. You'd know they'd go and work in a bank at nine o'clock on Monday morning. And you know they, a lot of them wouldn't be out to their mum and dad. It's, I mean, it's drama, isn't it? It's, it's, it's just such a dramatic setting so and you talk about standing there and thinking these things through i find your process fascinating because i could say to russell uh something about a, a plot or a story an idea and you'll say about a script that you haven't written a word of oh i can't do that because in scene 20 <laughs> this is going to happen do you literally have the entire script in your head before you sit down and type it um no but i have great big key moments. It's, I, know, I absolutely know how it ends. It's like, if we ever get to make The Boys, it's like, I know exactly what the last scene is there. And it needs a seagull. <laughs> There's a seagull in that scene. Um, so that, it's like, I literally know, oh, it's a great last scene. So you've got like tent poles, it's like, and, but, you, but at the same time, equally, if you saw me writing an episode, I'm sitting there with a blank page going, I don't know what happens. Uh, it's, it's still an enormous blank space. So it's both, it's kind of both at once. It's, it's like life, isn't it? You know what you want to do and it's all a mess and you make it up, there's no difference to writing. And it's how and you get there. Living, yes, it's, it's, it's the same thing. So can we talk a bit about your training as a writer? Though, which I know people, we've been saying that it's very difficult these days for writers to get a break because yes. there are so many less series that have stories of the week, so there's so many less opportunities to write on someone else's series. Mm. You started at Granada as a mm. writer, not in television, um, and it was a place that really looked out for young writers, that trained people, that put you yeah. on a job. There was you, Kay Meller, Paul Abbott, Sally Wainwright, all there at the same time. Yes. Can yes. you just talk a bit about what it was like to be it was, there? It was a powerhouse that we didn't realise at the time because it just felt like normal life at the time. It was Granada in the 90s. This was set up by David Lidemans and Tony Wood and Carolyn Reynolds. And they set up this system, like, for, for start, they had this great department called the Entertainment Department, in which there were no barriers between programmes. You'd have children's drama next to Coronation Street, next to Stars in Their Eyes, next to You've Been Framed. So you'd be in and out of those rooms. I knew how they put together You've Been Framed packages, and the You've Been Framed people would know what the, the storylines were doing on the street and stuff like that. It was, there were no walls. It was tremendously porous. It was brilliant. And, uh, but what David did, and Tony and Carolyn, was to set up, it's, like, it's all very well training writers and talking about training writers and developing scripts and stuff like that. But the only way you really learn is to do it, is, is writing in motion, in action. And they set up a system where they just scoured the schedules for gaps and created soap operas, specifically soap operas that fitted into gaps, like afternoon soap operas. And let's do, and Neighbours was popular, let's do a soap opera half set in Australia. So, so Kay created a show called Families. And then And they, what was your role on those? I, only, I was a storyliner, so I started as a story, which I was dying to do. I was absolutely dying to get into storylining. 
and banged on the door. So I started out as a script editor on children's. Well, you had children's drama being made there, so I was a script editor on that, and then the producer on that. But actually, I wanted to work on stories. I didn't want to produce. And, um, and then they invented, they, they, they got together with Carlton and Central to get a pot of money, and we invented, I, I invented a soap opera called Revelations. And then Paul Abbott and Frank Cottrell Boyce invented a soap opera for Sky called Spring Hill. They were just training grounds. So you get brand new writers in, and we'd all sit in rooms. They were mad. Spring Hill was the maddest <laughs> soap in the world. It was about the Antichrist being born on a Liverpool estate in a soap opera. It was a it daytime was, soap opera. A oh, daytime. Day, well, First of all, it went out on Sky, then for Series 2 to Channel 4 buy it. Was it the other way around? I forget. They, just, they would just make these things and get people to buy them and sell them. In, and to get, and that's how Sally was on this. Sally Wainwright was on these teams. Paul was there. It was, it was proper training. Anita Pandolfo was part of those teams as well. It was proper training to get people in. And you just, you just yearn for a system like that now. It was brilliant. Do you think that it could work in today's multi-channel well, Those gaps are still there. If anything, there's even more gaps. It's, um, how, how cheap were they? Were they very cheap to make? They were immensely. I mean, this was back in the 90s, so they would be made as a five... They'd be made on a schedule of five episodes a week, which soaps weren't being made on then. We were the ch I think, do you know, I think every... I think a half-hour soap then, I think we made those for 30,000 for half an hour. 30,000 pounds, that can't be right. We it did was it all right. the time. It was, I'm sure that was it. 30,000 pounds. <laughs> um, but what you learnt about storylining and structure and, and you'd be... The other thing, you know, and then they'd say, Jan McVerry, it was a brilliant writer and storyliner. She'd go on holiday to Madrid. So they'd say, Russell, can you just go and do storylining on the street for a month while she goes to Madrid? And you'd go in there and I was... It was in the days of Percy and Maud Grimes and, 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 and Phyllis Pierce and stuff like that. You'd be thrown into Coronation Street. And I only ever went to... And those are great people working on those shows. There are faults with the system, but you know, we could talk a long time about the stuff that's wrong with soap operas, inherently wrong. But, sod that, let's look at the good stuff, which is that um, there were such wise writers. I went to like one commissioning conference, one block of Coronation Street, and to this day, when I'm writing, I remember the things that the people around that table said. People like John Stevenson, Peter Wally, who passed away recently, who was, who was a genius. Uh, Julian Roach, Adele, Adele. Um, geniuses. They just come out, they just say stuff about character, about writing. I always remember, I had an episode, I'd stole an episode where Vera Duckworth stole a car in order to go and see Terry in prison. So she stole... <laughs> Ken Barlow's car. And I had Storyland on that, and that was fine. And then it was being written by Julian Roach, and he just said, this story doesn't work. This story doesn't work because you've got Vera stealing a car. It's no good unless someone sees her stealing the car. And so he just rewrote the story so that Jack Duckworth came out to the Rovers and saw his wife stealing this car. And suddenly the whole story became so much better. So you learn stuff like that. that how, do you, how do you learn that except by being in the job, you know, writing in motion under pressure? And to this day, you sit there thinking, I literally, you'll find myself doing a script thing, someone has to see that, someone has to observe that. That's Jack, Duck, Jack Duckworth coming out of the rovers and watching that. It's brilliant. So it gave you a set of rules or just a set of guidelines that you... It wasn't rule. It was, it was handy here because equally then you'll go and write a script where no one observes what's going on <laughs> and it suddenly works. It's like there aren't any rules as such, but what soap opera teaches you is that the story never ends. Never ends. You can write the biggest divorce and murder in the world. And then next week they have to have a new story. Next week Deirdre carries on. She does this, she does that. It's like, it's that great engine. There's things to unlearn from soap operas, like subtext, because uh, no, there, is, there, there isn't any. Right. Well, actually, it's very interesting watching the street now, because they've now got that Pat Phelan. They cast, Pat Fe they cast that actor as Pat Phelan uh, as a villain, and now they've kind of realised they've got one of the best actors in Britain. And so they're giving him layers and subtleties and unspoken text and, and, and secrets and things like that. And it's great to see a character coming alive like that. So it can be done. It can be done in soap. But, um, not often. People tend to walk in the room and say, if they're sad, a soap opera tends to walk in the room and say, I'm sad. That's, that's, that's it. It's its job, actually. It's just a great big engine to keep going.